All right, if y'all would, open in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're making our way through the book of Ecclesiastes. We're looking at the wisdom uh, that Solomon is giving us. And as we pointed out, uh, he's talking about the wisdom that he had learned as he lived under the sun. But he's also writing the things that he wrote by the inspiration of of the Holy Spirit, and so we need to understand that uh, Solomon writes in a way that is true, and he's going to tell us as we get in uh, later into the book that uh, the words that he gave are acceptable words, and that he wrote them down as upright words, and that we are to listen to these words because they are from the wise. And so remember that as we're going through the book of Ecclesiastes. So as we look, we're talking about wisdom is better than folly. Wisdom is better than folly. Remember he tells us in verse 8, let thy garments be always white and let thy, thy head lack no ointment. We pointed out last week in this study of this that Solomon is telling us uh, that when we go out into the world, present yourself in a way that is going to bring honor and glory to God. And I realize sometimes we're busy doing something and, and uh, we run to the Lowe's or Smith Slumber, whomever it is, groom and son, and we may be not uh, dressed in a way that uh, people are going to uh, recognize us. I know a lot of times people don't recognize me if I don't have a suit on. And they say, we're used to seeing you in a suit, not used to seeing you not in a suit. And so uh, we understand that Solomon is giving us day-to-day -day principles of life. And uh, get up in the morning, wash your face, comb your hair, put on clean garments, and go out into the world. He tells us to live joyfully in verse 9 with the wife of our youth, the one that we've loved all the days of our life, because he says this life is fleeting. And uh, as we mentioned last week, we realize that the world looks at God's uh, laws on marriage, divorce, and remarriage as outdated, even uh, ugly, some would say. Uh, I want to be happy and I can't be happy with this and so I'm going to divorce him. Find one that I can be happy with. Well, I find I'm not happy with that one, so I divorce him. I find another one and we just hop around, hop around, and we realize that is not a way that's conducive to bringing up children. It's not conducive to a society. Uh, it doesn't better the society. And so we understand why God uh, put in laws that protect marriage and family. It's vitally important to bring our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And if they're hopping from this family to this family to this grandparent and that grandparent and they have no place really that they can even call home, well, that's detrimental to children. And God wants us to bring those children up in a way that's right. So live joyfully with the wife that you love because... This life is fleeting. And so he tells us in verse 10, and really to me this is the uh, mantra of the chapter, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And as we pointed out last week, we work now. Uh, we're not going to be investing <laughs> in an IRA when we're in the grave. We're not going to be doing anything. And as the old adage is, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul uh, because those things of this life are gone when you die. And so there's no more. You can't, uh, you can't add to that 4K from the grave. And so Solomon is telling us that he returned, verse number 11, and saw under the sun that the race is not always, he says, to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. We pointed out last week when we looked at this that the fastest runner doesn't always win the race. Uh, he may stumble and fall. He may step out of his lane and become disqualified. And so the race is not, we look at it, uh, and, and I think a lot of this has been uh, taught to us 
the survival of the fittest. Well, the survival of the fittest doesn't always work, does it? Doesn't always happen that way. As a matter of fact, uh, if you go back and look at the things that Hitler and other despots have tried to do through the years, uh, they wanted to take people that were wearing glasses out of the gene pool because you're weakening the race. They said your, your, your eyes are detrimental to the betterment and so they wanted the perfect man and the perfect woman and they bred them like animals and you can do the research yourself and find that out. But what was the thought process of Hitler? He was thinking along Darwinian evolution and we need to have the master race. And he said other races are inferior to the Caucasian race. And that's just simply not true. We're all one race. We all have the same blood, Paul said in Acts chapter 17. We all have the same ancestors. And by the way, they are now doing more and more research. And uh, this research in looking at the DNA, they're finding that the DNA very clearly is telling us that there is a recent and we say recent, within the last 4,000 years, there was a population, because that's when everybody got, when Noah and his family got off the ark. There were only eight souls. And that's roughly 4,000 years ago. And so now they're looking at it and they're saying, even what we call Native Americans, they're looking at it and they're saying, wait, their DNA, they're related to this group of people. They're, they're related, others are related to this group. So it looks like there was migratory, you know, people were coming over and over. And so uh, this is turning Darwinian evolution on its head, but you're not hearing about it in the, the mainstream media because the mainstream media doesn't want to present that to the world. They want to tear down the Bible. But we're making the point that time and chance happens to everybody whether you're the fastest runner, whether you're the best shot, whether you're the strongest man, whatever it is, the wisest man, you still don't always, as it were, win the race. So in verse number 12, Solomon says, For man also knoweth that his time, or excuse me, for man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taking in the evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. We all realize that uh, death is most often an unwelcome visitor to our house. And we may be young, we may be strong, and we may die of an accident. We may be young, and we may be strong, but we may have a genetic defect that we don't even realize and we might fall over from a heart attack and die at a very young age. And as a gospel preacher, I've had to do lots of funerals for lots of people that they weren't expecting to die. They thought they had a long life in front of them. And it doesn't always happen that way, does it? So then, beginning in verse number 13, and I think I... I uh, got a little bit ahead of myself. What he's going to do beginning in verse 13 is to talk about the value of wisdom. The value of wisdom. He says, This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. Verse 14, there was a little city. And very few men, he says, few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. In verse number 15, the Bible says, Now there was found in that uh, city, in it, a poor wise man, and he was, or excuse me, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Now watch this. Yet no man remembereth that same poor man. What is Solomon saying in verse 15? Remember as we've gone through this study, he's talked about verse number 4, there, the, the living dog is better than a dead lion. So you've got this wise man, but he happens to be poor. He delivers a city. 
and yet nobody remembers His name. Don't we know that? How many of us can tell the history of the city of Athens? Maybe even the history of the city of our birth or the place that we grew up. There are so many people that have done so many things and their names are forgotten. Their family might remember them a little bit and then generations go by and they don't remember their, their own ancestors. So Solomon is telling us that this man who was wise yet poor saved the city but nobody remembered him. And I think the implication is because he was a poor man. Who are we most enamored with as societies? The rich, the wealthy, the good looking, the powerful. And we're enamored with that. And here's this poor wise man that does great things, but he doesn't have any wealth. And we don't pay any attention to him. That's what Solomon is telling us. So as we go to verse number 16, he tells us, Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Now watch this. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Clearly, Solomon is telling us that as we look at this world, we need to understand that wisdom is better than strength, but we also need to understand that people are people and poor people most often are despised no matter how wise they are. And you know this as well as I do. There is a society, uh, uh, or I don't know, there's a, uh, a section in our society, and it's not uncommon in other societies as well, but there is this notion that uh, if you don't have the degrees that are supposed to make you wise, then people don't, they're not willing to listen to you. And they may even say, if you bring up a subject, they may say, well, what degree do you have? You're speaking from a position of authority. What degrees do you have? And I don't remember who it was. I was watching a debate the other day, and the guy asked him the question about what degrees he had. And he said, well, I don't have any uh, college-level degrees, if that's what you're asking me. But he said, I know how to read. And I know how to do research. And I know how to take data and make a point from that. But there is that status symbol and uh, arrogancy and snottiness that we see sometimes because you don't have a degree. I don't want to hear what you've got to say. Or I want to act like that's my idea. <laughs> yeah, or they take your idea and say, that's my idea. And then they they're able to push it, and that happens more often than what we'd like to admit. So verse 17, the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. What Solomon is doing, and he's going to do this through chapter 10, he's really setting forth things in the form of Proverbs, aren't they? He's giving us proverbial knowledge. And by the way, what was it? Solomon wrote uh, 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs, if I remember correctly. So uh, Solomon wrote a lot of proverbs. Uh, I don't know that we have all 3,000 of them. I don't know. We may have more that he collected. I, I haven't counted all the proverbs and if Solomon was the writer of all of them. But when you think about it, what he's doing is setting forth proverbial truths. And, and when we say it's a, a proverb, well, we understand that by nature, a proverb is not setting forth the case that this will be 100% of the time. Train up a child in the way that he should go. Proverbs 22 and verse 6, when he's old, he's not going to depart from it. And then we see a, an older child left home, gets married, and they fall away. And we say, well, the parents are at fault. It's their fault because you bring up a child in the way that he's going. When he's old, he's not going to depart from it. Well, there's several things that are flawed in that kind of reasoning. 
First off, you don't know what their life is going to be like in 20 years. They may come back to the truth. That's what we all pray, isn't it? That, they, they, that when they do get older, and they do get wiser, and they realize the craziness, the stupidity really, of what they're doing, they may very well return to the truth. And so this is a proverbial statement, and it doesn't mean that it's going to be 100% of the time. If he got married, he had peer pressure. <laughs> That's right. So when we look at this, he says the words of wise men are heard in the quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. What is Solomon saying in that? Wise men often speak in settings that are not public brawling type situation, right? So you've got uh, the, the, the Dairy Queen and you've got the round table of knowledge there, you know. <laughs> so what I'm saying is you've got this wisdom that is often shared. And this is one of the reasons that we know that iron sharpens iron that we sharpen one another in the quiet of a conversation. More wisdom is brought than in this raucous crowd where people are shouting and you've got a fool up leading them all in this. And so he says, the wise man's words are heard in a quiet place more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. By the way, when we look at many times the rulers of nations, we see them fall into the category of the foolish, don't we? That's sad to me that as society, you know, we start out, most societies start out with very wise men ruling and running. You can go through the book of Kings and you can see Saul didn't do very good, but then David came along and Solomon came along there were a few kings as you look into the history of Israel. You look into the Roman Empire. You look into the Greek Empire, the Babylonian Empire. They started out with very wise men, but what happened? Those wise men died. Their sons were not as wise, and then their grandsons were even more foolish and more foolish. And before long, you've got a bunch of fools running a society. And then what happens to the society? It collapses, it fails. It just collapses because it can't be sustained. That's frightening to me, but it's true. Then he tells us in the final verse of chapter 9, wisdom is better than the weapons of war. Have you ever heard a phrase, the pen is what? Mightier than the sword. The pen is mightier than the sword. When a person comes from a place of wisdom. That's better than the weapons of war. And we realize that. We see it in diplomacy all the time. You know, you can bomb somebody into submission or you can target without the loss of life, but most people aren't willing to do that. But he says wisdom is better than weapons of war, but notice this next phrase, but one sinner destroyeth much good. One sinner can throw a monkey wrench into the whole thing, right? They tear everything up. So any thoughts before we go to chapter 10? That one sinner probably has a high temper. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. Uh, yeah, uncontrolled. You know, and there's nothing to me, to me, <laughs> that is uh, sad than seeing every aspect of their life. It's just frightening to me. So when we move to chapter 10, I think this is my thing. I think really chapter 10 and verse 1 goes with chapter 9. Notice what he says. Dead flies in the ointment 
or dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor, so doth a little folly in him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Remember that he just said wisdom is better than the weapons of war. And then he moves to this thought, dead flies cause the ointment, and you may, uh, you may have another translation that has perfume. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other words that I saw it translated as. Um, the apothecary is the one that mixes different things together for the smell, the aroma. And so he says, you get this fly in this good ointment that smells good and then it begins to stink because of the fly that is died and it's in the uh, ointment now and it, it brings in the bacteria, the germs, and so it now, instead of smelling good, it smells foul. I think that goes with what he's saying in chapter 9. I think this verse, as I said a moment ago, ties to verse chapter 9 because notice this. Just as a dead fly causes the perfume to stink, he says, so doth a little folly in him that has a reputation for wisdom and honor. That folly can damage whatever else you have. Your reputation is ruined because of just one thing. One thing. It's all it takes. And your reputation, your reputation is gone. Hard to ever trust again. Uh, you look at that person and, and I realize that we can repent. But we also have to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. And a wise man that gets caught up in foolishness is just like that dead fly in the ointment. This little foolishness, little dead fly, how is that going to change the smell of of this perfume. Well, it does. How does this little sin in my life hurt my reputation? It does. And it that's just a fact. Solomon is setting that forth as a fact. And he's saying a little foolishness, a little folly in a man that is of reputation damages him. The man that's known for wisdom and honor and then he does something ridiculous. And we all, we just... Just think about the man that rises to a, a position of authority and has people looking up to him and the next thing you hear, he's running around on his wife. And, and, and that reputation is gone. is gone. All the good that he's done is forgotten most times. Well, it makes you think what was his background and where did he come from and what, what might he have been doing at the time he gave great advice. Yes. And that's, that's the problem, isn't it? We, we begin to think and say, well, you know, he gave me some advice. Was that good advice or not? Because now I don't know. Don't know that I can trust this man in what he does and what he says. So as we move to verse number 2, and maybe this does, one in one does go with this chapter because he starts talking about foolishness cannot be hidden. Foolishness can't be hidden. What is the old adage? They thought I was a fool and I opened my mouth and confirmed it. <laughs> I opened my mouth and they, they really, yeah, well, I knew that's what's coming. So verse 2, he says, A wise man heart is his right hand, but a fool's heart is at, it is a fool's heart at his left. Uh, this verse has been uh, hijacked recently. You've probably seen it. Uh, why do we call conservatives the right and liberals the left? Have you seen this? And they, they will put 
Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 2 because a wise man's heart is on the right side, on his right hand, but a fool's on his left hand. Solomon is not talking about conservative and liberal, even though, like I say, this verse has been hijacked. You've seen it on Facebook uh, for the last five years. That, uh, well, why do we call the conservative right and the liberals left? Well, because Solomon says the wise man's heart is on his right. That's not what Solomon is saying. Uh, he's telling us that the wise man is going to be doing the things that are right. I don't know all the implications. I, I, I'm not enough of a, a historian, especially about, among the Hebrew people, but it seems that this right hand is the hand of wisdom and the left hand is the hand of foolishness. For whatever reason that came about, I, I'm not sure. Yes, sir, Bob? Yeah, I think in most instances, the right hand is considered the strength, hand of strength, and the left hand is considered weaker. Uh, that, and that's, that's true, and, and you know this, uh, especially, don't see it now, but if a kid came along and they were writing left-handed, Many times the teacher would say, no, no, you gotta, you got to change that and you've got to write with your right hand. Uh, so there is that connotation that the left hand, for whatever reason, is weak and bad and you don't, need to, you don't need to write with your left hand. I'm glad those days are behind us for the most part, that we don't, we don't do things like that. I know I had a basketball coach. For whatever reason, I shot the basketball left-handed and I was right-handed in everything else, bat, Batting, throwing, everything, but I shot left, and he, he was left-handed, but he, he made me change, and now I can't hit the broad side of the barn with a basketball, uh, uh, and then I had this shoulder surgery, and now every time I shoot, I'm about a foot short, <laughs> so I don't know, but he's telling us that a wise man's heart is on his right, a foolish man, his heart is on the left. Verse 3, he says, yea, also, now watch this, when he... He's talking about the foolish man. When he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. He's talking about himself? <laughs> uh, I think what he's saying there is that you can tell a foolish person by the way that they live their life, the way that they walk. Uh, I know that many of you are familiar with the name Dave Ramsey. He's the, the guru on money that many people go to. And, uh, you know, he will start asking questions about, well, where is your money going? You know, you're bringing in X amount of dollars and you got 2X going out, two times that. What, where, where's the money going? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Get your bank statement out, get your phone app out, whatever you've got, start looking. And many times, you will find that you're still paying for a subscription that you're not using. Maybe it's Netflix and you haven't been on Netflix in 100 years and here you are, I'm still paying $12.99 a month for that. And start going through, start weeding out some of those unnecessary things. But what he's telling us that the fool, as he's walking and his wisdom, as he's living and doing things, his wisdom is foolishness, so his wisdom fails him. And everybody says, look at that idiot. What is he doing? By the way he walks. By the way he lives, you can tell a foolish man. So a foolish man... When he walks, his wisdom fails. And then he shows everybody he's a fool. And that's the lifestyle. Again, as we said a moment ago, when you start thinking about the man that has a great reputation, but a little bit of folly ruins it. So he's saying the foolish man, when his wisdom fails him, everybody knows him for what he is, right? Again, you open your mouth. They think you're a fool. You open your mouth and you confirm it. And they say, yeah, he was a fool. So, any thoughts before we go to verse 4? 
He's going to change a little bit by saying now there is foolishness in high places. Foolishness in high places. What do we mean by high places? Power. I'm sorry? Power. People of authority. People of authority, people that rule, and there's a lot of foolishness in high places today right here in America, and y'all know that as well as I do. So he says in verse 4, If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. What is he saying in that verse? Keep your calm. Okay, stay calm. What else? Okay, stand your ground. Remain true to your faith. Okay, remain true to your faith. What you know is right, and uh, stay true to that, and don't let anybody uh, take you away from that. I'm trying to pull up the uh, other versions that I have here. Uh, it says in the English Standard Version, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses at rest. So, uh, you've got a ruler. For whatever reason, he gets mad at you. I think that Solomon is saying, you don't back off. You know, it's amazing to me that, uh, well, we say it all the time with politicians, we've got a term. They once said this, now they say that. What do we call that? Flip-flop. Flip -flop. They flip-flop. They, they, they're against it over here, and then they're, they're running for election, and they see that's not popular, so now they're for it. And the, the, the person in high places vacillating between contradictory positions, and he corners you, and I, I'm just going to use one, and, and I, I'm not trying to be political at all, but when we start talking about, it used to be called global warming. Now it's got a new name. It's climate change. Uh, you go back to the 70s, and probably everybody here, except maybe Tad, might not remember quite back to the 70s. But in the 70s, in the late 1970s, they were predicting that we were fixing to go into an ice age. We're going into an ice age. They got it backwards. And then they started seeing the data and the temperatures were starting to climb. And so the very scientists that were pushing were coming on a global ice age changed and now we're having global warming you know it seems to me that that just is the nature of the climate so then they come up with this phrase climate change well duh <laughs> the climate changes every day and they say no no you're talking about weather we're talking about climate well how do you get climate without weather how do you do that? So now y'all remember, and what was the hurricane, the, the, the big hurricane that hit earlier this year? What was the name of it? I can't even think of it. But, oh, this is going to be the worst year. We're going to have, did I say hurricane or tornado? Hurricane. Oh, it's going to be a bad year. We're going to have hurricane after hurricane after hurricane, and it's going to be the worst. And it doesn't happen. And then they say, well, the model is, is changing a little bit because we can't predict. Now we've done so much damage to, damage to the climate, we can't. And uh, people vacillate and people change. But when you're right, don't leave your place because when you yield... You just pacify that. And that's why so many politicians are right now 
unwilling to stand for anything because they don't know what the, which way is the wind blowing today. Because yesterday it was blowing out of the south. Now it's blowing out of the north. Tomorrow it may be the east or the west. We don't know which way the wind's going to be blowing. And so when we do that, we're like, okay, uh, I, I, I'll, just, uh, I'll just sit here and, and people will get mad at me and then I'll change and then they'll get mad again and I'll change back. You're not doing any good. And that yielding, not standing your ground, leads people to great offenses. How is that? Because foolishness is always going to hate the what is right and what is good and the one that doesn't change. You know, it's amazing to me that uh, I was talking to a guy, we were having a Bible study here, oh, I don't know, maybe a month ago. And uh, he's got a denominational background. And I was telling you, you realize, because he, he, he has a hang-up on instrumental music. Y'all, y'all know, that's the, the, the one that gets most folks, you know, uh, baptism and instrumental music or a deal breaker for a lot of people. And I said, do you know the history of the denomination that you were raised in? When that denomination started, they were vehemently opposed to using mechanical instruments of music in the worship. The very founder said that this is a sign of Baal. That's idol worship. And I said, do you, do you even know your own history? Because your founding fathers of the religion that you're a member of vehemently opposed instrumental music in worship. Now 500 years later, when you tell them that, they don't even believe you. They don't even, there's no way that's true. Well, get your history books out. Search it yourself. Find out if that's not true. Because it is. And there is not a Protestant group, and I'm talking about mainline Protestants, that when they started out, they did not use. They just refused to use instruments of music in the worship. Some of them said, well, that, we're not doing it because that was one of the first uh, introductions into the Roman Catholic Church that was a sign of their departing from God. So it's a, it's a, it's a going back to Roman Catholicism, they argued. We're not going to do that over and over again. They argued against the use of mechanical instruments. And now... Oh, you're crazy if you don't use them. But where have we stood as churches of Christ? Through all the storms and the hurricanes and the assaults, faithful members of the Lord's body are still standing on that principle. And it doesn't matter who tells us that it's wrong. We go to the Word of God. What did God say? Sing. That ought to be enough. You know, you think about this. If you uh, go out and you build a corral and you take 20 panels to set that corral up and you put your cow in it, does it have to jump over all 20 panels to be out of the fence? Or does it jump over one? Just one panel. And he's out of the gate. He's out of the corral. He's gone. So brethren, one thing is vitally important because... That is a sign of your heart and where your heart is. So if the ruler gets mad at you, you just keep on preaching the truth, right? Any thoughts before we end? I looked up, time's gone. I, it, it just flies. That's why dad flies in the ointment. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, Lord willing, we'll come back next week. We'll pick up chapter 10 and verse 5. We'll continue this thought that Solomon is presenting. Foolishness in high places is bad. And then, of course, we're going to get to uh, chapter 11 and chapter 12. And when you get to chapter 12 is where Solomon says, 
I want to hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What, what have I learned in all that I've done, in all that I've read, in all that I've said, what have I learned? Fear God and keep His commandments. That's the whole of man. So let's do that this evening. If you're not a child of God, we plead with you to respond to the gospel. As one of God's children, if you need prayers, please come as we stand and as we sing.